So let's start again. So the next talk uh, will be of uh, Simeon Mistakidis, and he will be talking about dipolar BECs uh, with uh, rotation. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and uh, let me again thank all uh, the speakers for the very nice talks up to now, and of course all the participants. So today I will uh, talk about two separate stories. Uh, the first one will be about the phase diagram and uh, the dynamics of uh, dipolar Bose-Einstein condensates subjected to a fastly rotating magnetic field. And then I will switch a little bit gears and I will not discuss uh, long-range interactions but still magnetic atoms. And uh, I will discuss in particular the classification of universal dynamics in spin one strongly uh, interacting uh, ferromagnetic condensates. So our work on uh, <coughs> dipolar gas is available in physical review research. And before I start my presentation, let me also thank NSF for funding our research here at ITAM. OK, so this brings me to the outlook of my talk. First, I will provide a very brief introduction into the concept of dipolar Bose-Einstein condensates. I don't have to do more than that because all the experts are here. Then I will discuss the phase diagram and the spontaneous generation of uh, droplet. Uh, clusters upon quenches uh, of uh, the S-wave interactions. And finally, in this story, I will try to convince you and argue that uh, using this fastly rotating magnetic field, we can, <clears throat> to a certain extent, achieve some prolongation of lifetime of these self-bound states. And then, as I said, I will switch a little bit gears and discuss a little bit the classification of the universal dynamics in spin-1 gases. Okay, so Dipolar quantum gases consist uh, <clears throat> uh, commonly in the experiment either by dysprosium, erbium, or very recently by europium atoms. These atoms have very large magnetic moment and under, as you see here, for an uh, elongated gas, under the um, uh, impact of an external magnetic field, they can be aligned. And then we can distinguish roughly two different situations. Either the dipoles can be aligned to an external magnetic field, R uh, unit R uh, is the unit vector here of the dipoles, EZ is the unit vector of the external magnetic field. If they are aligned, uh, <coughs> if they are aligned parallel, then this will lead to a head-to-tail arrangement and the dipoles will attract each other. And uh, on the opposite case, where they align perpendicular to the external magnetic field, this will lead to a head-to-tail uh, to a side-by-side -side distribution, sorry, and the dipoles will be repulsive. So, uh, it is uh, in these gases the interplay between long-range and isotropic dipole-dipole interactions and short-range S-wave ones that lead to various many-body phases of matter, and these include, for instance, anisotropic superfluidity or the generation and formation of exotic uh, bound states of matter like quantum droplets and supersolids that we will discuss today. So, for instance, here you see uh, in the left, uh, in the most left-right panels, the density distribution, a characteristic density distribution of a droplet lattice in uh, two-dimensional geometry and the supersolid. In the droplet, you see that we have well-localized density hums that are uh, almost non-communicative between each other, while in the supersolid we have an accumulation of density bumps on top of a superfluid that are weakly linked, these bumps, by this superfluid, by the background superfluid, and this leads to the supersolid, roughly, pictorially, state of matter. These states have been observed recently uh, in a series of experiments, and especially the supersolid is believed up to now that it combines essentially the superflu uh, a superfluid frictionless flow and it has simultaneously the crystal arrangement of a uh, solid. Okay, so in these gases, the really nice thing is that there is, the there is uh, an unstable eigenmode, the so called rotten mode. You see special characteristic special profiles of this mode of the lower line and the first and few first excited ones here, and also the dispersion relation uh, of this dipolar gas. So for strong repulsive dipole, uh, for strong attractive dipole-dipole interactions, we have this roton softening, and then this leads the dipolar gas to collapse. However, here, if uh, we include quantum fluctuations into our gas, and these are commonly modeled by the first order Li Huanyang uh, quantum correction, 
it act, they act repulsively in three dimensions, and in particular as n to three half. They stabilize the gas and they lead to formation of these exotic phases of matter. And if uh, under these uh, first order corrections, uh, first order correction, we can have theoretical concepts like the extended Korsbitevsky that I will also use here in this work in order to describe the static and the dynamic properties of the systems. And this concept, this framework, uh, has been shown to very nicely describe all experimental observations. Okay, so here what I will do is to use a fastly rotating magnetic field in order uh, essentially to tune the dipole-dipole interactions, both the magnitude and their sign, and I will try to show you the impact of this uh, anisotropy on the, the self-bound state formation and how we can really shift the phase boundaries between the exotic phases of matter. And also I will discuss a little bit <coughs> metastable states that arise during the dynamics and how we can dynamically nucleate these states. Okay. So, this will be the setup under consideration. It will be a quasi two dimensional uh, dipolar gas of these prosium atoms in the XY plane. And we have an external magnetic field that is tilted with respect to the z axis with a uh, tilt angle phi. And this will be really fastly rotating. Why is that? So, first of all, the dipoles will be aligned along this unit vector, this unit vector E of t will have, will contain the tilt angle, but also the angular frequency of the external magnetic field. And this angular frequency will be chosen that, such that it is much larger than the external trap frequency, but much smaller than the Larmor precision frequency, precision frequency of the dipoles. In this way, the dipoles will, will <coughs> essentially instantaneously follow the field rotation. Okay, so, since I will consider a fastly rotating magnetic field, it will be completely legitimate that what I will do is to consider essentially a time average version of the dipole-dipole interaction potential over a full rotation cycle. And if I do that, then I will end up with this um, uh, interaction potential, dipole-dipole interaction potential. It has the R to the cube dependence in the denominator, so it is long range and also this direct product between <coughs> the unit vector of the magnetic field and the dipoles in the denominator, and that's why it is anisotropic. So here what we have to <coughs> observe is that there is a magic angle, phi m, phi m at which the dipole-dipole interaction potential vanishes. Then we have just short-range interactions into our system, so we will have only superfluid states to care about. However, we can tune this tilt angle, and in particular, if we tune this tilt angle and increase its magnitude, but lying below the magic one, then we can think that in the xy plane, we will increase the, um, sorry, we will decrease the magnitude of the dipole-dipole interaction, and the dipoles will be repulsive. In the opposite case, where we will further increase the tilt angle, but above the magic one, then the dipole, dipole interaction will flip sign, so it will become attractive. And as I increase its magnitude, then also I will increase, uh, as I will increase the tilt angle, also the magnitude of the dipole-dipole interaction potential will increase. Okay. So, in order to describe the ground state properties and the dynamics of the system, what I will do is to rely on this three-dimensional extend cross pitaevsky equation. What it has is that the first, or the first term is the kinetic term. The second term is the three-dimensional harmonic trap that I will consider. The third term has the S-wave interactions. The fourth one is the first-order quantum correction, the Li Huang-Yang. And the last term is just the anisotropic dipole-dipole interaction potential. Okay. In particular, I will consider these trap frequencies taken from the experiment, and I will use for my description, these prosium atoms having this magnetic moment and this dipolar length. And what I will do now is to consider in, uh, <coughs> variations of the relative interaction between the dipole-dipole interaction and the S-wave one. And this is quantified by this epsilon d parameter. Okay? So, what you see here is the phase diagram in the case that I have an aligned magnetic field in the z-direction. So, no rotation, very simple, Z, uh, static field in the z-direction. 
So what you see here is the phase diagram in, in terms of the particle number and also this relative interaction strength parameter. And in the color bar, what you see is the chemical potential of the system. Okay. So for relatively small the relative interaction uh, strength, what we will have is a superfluid state, simply because the S-wave interactions will dominate with respect to the dipole-dipole ones. Then as I increase this relative strength parameter, and in particular when the dipole-dipole interaction becomes comparable to the S-wave one, and in the vicinity of the zero chemical potential that is shown here with the dust white line, I will have for large particle numbers the formation of a supersolid. If I further increase the relative interaction strength, then the dipole-dipole interactions will prevail and I will have, depending on the particle number, either a single droplet or multiple droplet state. This DLS and DLM that you see here. Okay. So, in order to visualize all these phases that I described below, here what I show you is the two-dimensional uh, densities in the XY plane for different relative interaction strength parameters. So, in the first one, uh, where the relative interaction strength is relatively small, we have a, a nicely smooth two-dimensional Thomas Fermi profile. This is a, just the superfluid that we all know. Then, if I increase the relative strength uh, <coughs> between the dipole-dipole and the S-wave ones, then uh, humps will start to accumulate on top of uh, the background superfluid. They will be weakly linked by this and I will have this characteristic profile of a supersolid. And if I further increase this relative strength uh, parameter, the dipole-dipole will prevail, and all these density bumps will strongly localize in space. They will not communicate between each other. And here I have D2 energy considerations, just a hexagonal droplet lattice. Okay? Then, uh, up to now, we discussed uh, the phase diagram in the case of a static magnetic field, but now what will happen when we consider the rotation? So here what you see is three different characteristic phase diagrams. In the first one with a static magnetic field, in the second I have a finite tilt angle, but below the magic one, and in the third a, an even larger tilt angle, but above the magic one. Okay, so if I compare now the first and the second plots here, what I will see is that the supersolid region shrinks, the same happens for the droplet, and all of them are shifted towards larger relative strength interactions. Yeah? This is simply because when I increase the tilt angle uh, uh, and being up, uh, below the magic one, what I do effectively is to decrease the magnitude of the dipole-dipole interactions. Then, if I increase further the tilt angle, but above the magic one, the dipole-dipole interaction flips, sign, it becomes strongly attractive, and here in this so-called dipolar regime, what I will have ultimately is just the formation of a superfluid or a single droplet phase. Yeah? yeah Due to the strong... Uh, sure. About the uh, LHY correction. Uh, yes. If you have this time averaging, mm -hmm. uh, how do you treat the LHY uh, correction? Do you assume that it's like this epsilon that you are plotting here, or is it a time average epsilon, or what? This is a time average epsilon, yes. Uh, okay, and uh, I mean, if you flip the sign, for mm -hmm. example, you are also flipping the sign of the... Uh, of the what, LHY? Of, of the LHY, or...? Yes, so the LHY that I consider is this one, yeah? Ah, so, yeah, yeah. okay. So this rotation is really fast. So if, uh, for instance, in the simulations, either I instantaneously follow the magnetic field or I do the time average for the uh, dipolar potential, I get the same result. Yeah, It's so fast. So it's at least 300 times the trap frequency. If I go below, then defects will start to crea be created in my density, and then this approximation will not be valid anymore at all. But this is a different regime. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. And in the attractive dipole dipole interaction, I will end up with a superfluid or a single droplet phase. Okay. 
So now what I will do is also to start to try to dynamically nucleate these phases. And to do so, what I will do is to start with the initial superfluid phase, yeah, and just consider an S-wave uh, equence of the S-wave interaction towards either the droplet or the supersolid regime. Now I will show you just the, super, the droplet regime, but the same will uh, occur also for the, the supersolid. Okay? So, when I <coughs> quench the S-wave interaction and I go from the superfluid to the droplet regime, what I do effectively is to seed the corresponding roton instability that we talked about previously. This will lead to a dynamical deformation of my state and will nucleate, as we will see, this uh, droplet uh, lattices. So here what you see is characteristic density snapshots of a uh, quasi two-dimensional dipolar Bose-Einstein condensate starting from a superfluid state. So initially you see that we have a nicely formed smooth Thomas Fermi uh, two-dimensional profile. Then as time evolves, ring-like structures start to accumulate in the density. This manifests that uh, lower line groton modes participate in the dynamics. They subsequently fragment one after each other because higher line rotons uh, participate. And then uh, we have the nucleation of a droplet lattice. This is quite disordered because we have used also an external noise in our wave function during the quench. Okay, so what I said up to now was for, for sure for a closed system. However, in the experiments, there are also three body, significant three-body recombination processes that leads, lead to loss processes in the system. And I want to show you now that even by including these three-body recombination processes, we can see the generation, the dynamical generation of these structures. And also, the most important thing here is that by using this fastly rotating magnetic field, we can achieve a certain lifetime prolongation of these self-bound states. So what I will do in order to uh, monitor the dynamics is I will use again the previous three-dimensional cross pitevsky equation, but I will use also this last imaginary term here, which scales with the this K3 coefficient, which is the recombination rate and the density square. The important <coughs> property here is that we know from scattering theory that since if we use this tilted magnetic field, this fastly tilted magnetic field, we can distinguish between two different situations of the three-body recombination rate. I, depending on uh, the comparison between the S-wave interaction and the dipolar length. So, uh, the three-body recombination can scale either as d to the 4 or as to the 4. And I will show you now that in the crossover between these two regions, we can achieve a certain lifetime prolongation. Here is what you see here, which depicts the uh, dynamics of the atom number as a uh, during the evolution for a specific epsilon dd parameter. So I fixed my relative interaction strength to the droplet phase. And what I do for the different colors here is to change the tilt angle. Yeah? But lying always below the magic one. So what you see here is that as we increase the tilt angle, we can achieve a certain uh, extent of lifetime prolongation of the drop. Okay? And of course, at the small evolution times, sorry, I forgot to say that, we can also see the nucleation of droplet lattices. The same happens for the supersolid, and the same results holds also in the quasi-1D geometry, both for the static and the dynamical properties. Okay, so now I would like to switch a little bit gears and uh, uh, discuss a little bit the classification of the universal dynamics in a strongly ferromagnetic spin-1 Bose-Einstein condensate. Our work also is available in archive here. Okay. So, let me say a little bit, a few things about spinor gases. So, spinor gases uh, are not long-range interacting. We have only short-range interactions here, but we have uh, magnetism, yeah? So, these gases are known pretty well up to now that they can host a plethora of quantum phase transitions, both first and second order. These gases are characterized by spin-dependent and spin-independent interactions. This C1 coefficient is uh, the spin-dependent interaction that you see here. For sodium-23 is uh, positive, for rubidium-87 is 
negative. Yeah? And according to this, we can realize different first and second order transitions. For with the dust green lines here, you see the boundaries of second order transitions, and with the red ones, you see here, you see the uh, boundaries of first order transitions. Okay. So these phase diagrams are plotted with respect to the quadratic Zeeman energy coefficient and the linear and the linear one. However, uh, up to now, what it has been used in the literature is either uh, sodium-23 or rubidium-87, and the main disadvantage of these two gases is that they have weak spin-dependent interactions compared to the spin-independent ones. In particular, uh, sodium-23 has a ratio of one point, roughly 1.5% and rubidium-87, 0.5. Yeah? However, these gases have been used enorm uh, vastly in the literature and have diverse applications to understand spin textures, nonlinear excitations, uh, vortex structures, testifying the kibble zurich mechanism, and so on. And very recently, they have been used also to, to diagnose dynamical criticality and measure critical exponents. A major obstacle, of course, up to now, is the was the weak uh, spin-dependent interactions compared to the spin independent ones that uh, essentially prevented the, uh, mon uh, to monitor these gases for long evolution times in the experiment at least. Here what I will show you is that using lithium-7 gas which is strongly ferromagnetic, yeah, it has 45 percent so it's an order of magnitude larger than the other ones, this will allow us to classify the universality class of uh, the underlying phase transitions and also monitor the evolution of the gas for long evolution times. Yeah? And see also the underlying, the create topological defects. So what we will do is to have, a, and this is a work colla uh, in collaboration with the experiment. Yeah? Okay. So what we do here is to have a quasi-two-dimensional spin 1bc with this number of atoms. This is uh, the frequencies of our external trap. And uh, we will initialize all atoms in the so-called polar phase here, which means that all atoms initially will re uh, lie only in the zero hyperfine level. So I forgot, sorry for that, I forgot to, to mention that this spin 1 gases under the external magnetic field, we can split to three different hyperfine levels, plus, minus one, and zero. And here I will start with a quadratic Zeeman energy coefficient that lies in the polar phase, and I will populate only the zero hyperfine level. And then what I will do is to quench this quadratic Zeeman either to the, the so-called easy axis phase, where in the ground state I will, should see population only of the plus, minus one hyperfine levels, or to the isotropic point where all states should be populated. For uh, reasons of time, I will just talk about the easy axis quench here, but similar results, maybe even more uh, complex, will uh, uh, hold also for the isotropic phase. Okay, so the initial phase, as we said, is the zero phase. Only the zero hyperfine level is populated, and we will quench to the easy axis where, in the ground state, plus minus one states are populated, and this state has also U1 cross Z2 spin inversion symmetry. Okay? Okay, so to tackle theoretically this problem, I will use this three dimensional coupled set of mean field equations of motion. Yeah? This is the kinetic term, this is the external three-dimensional trap, this is the quadratic Zeeman coefficient, Fz here is the spin Pauli matrices, C0 here models the spin independent nonlinearity, and C1 the spin dependent one. What I will do is to first initialize my system in the mean field ground state of the polar phase with a specific quadratic Zeeman, so only the zero component will be populated, and then what I will do is to use a linearization. Uh, I will linearize my solution around my mean field solution, which is the polar phase, and 
perturbed by a weak amplitude here epsilon and the eigenmodes and eigenvectors of the system. Uh, eigenmodes and eigenfrequency of the system. Sorry. Okay. So in order to uh, calculate this, I solve this eigenvalue problem. I determine my eigenvalues and eigenfrequencies, and I use this noise field, which is a superposition of the corresponding u uh, eigenmodes and betas, which are random values that are chosen for the plus minus one level from a Gaussian distribution with zero vari uh, unit variance and zero uh, and unit mean, and also for the zero hyperfine level, I will use the Boltzmann distribution. Of course, this uh, choice of to use quantum fluctuations in the plus minus one channels and zero in the um, uh, and uh, sorry, and thermal fluctuations in the zero hyperfine level is motivated by the experimental observations. Eh? Okay. So. I prepare my state, <coughs> my system in the Z, in the polar phase. I do a quench to the easy axis, and here is the spin populations during the evolution of the different hyperfine levels. So initially, as you see, everything is in the zero hyperfine level, and here we can distinguish different dynamical stages of this evolution. For short evolution times, we have an almost exponential increase of the plus minus one populations. Yeah? and an exponential decrease of the zero. This, as I will argue now uh, in the next slide, it will be associated with the formation of topological defects, which in this case are gauge vortices. Yeah? Then these vortices will start and anti-vortices will start to uh, interact and annihilate or drift out of the condensate. And this will lead to the formation of magnetic domains. And these magnetic domains, after forming, they will start to merge. And <clears throat> finally, I will enter the, the so-called coarsening stage, where my gas has universal properties. OK. So in order to show you <coughs> the different dynamical stages here, what you see is the uh, two, uh, characteristic density uh, snapshots during the evolution in the upper panels of the plus one component, in the, in the lower panels of the minus one component. Yeah? The zero I don't show because essentially the zero, although it has initially full population of all atoms, then it just loses it. Okay. So what we see here is that initially, for short evolution times, we have the creation of gauge vortices and anti-vortices in the system, which you can see here by the dips of in the density. Then these interact and annihilate or drift out of the condensate. They give rise to magnetic domains. And these magnetic domains start to increase essentially their length. And at the end of the evolution, I end up with a single domain well between the plus minus one components. Okay. So in order to convince you that these dips that I told you before are vortices, what I show you here is essentially the wave function phase of the minus one component, where you see with these crosses the two pi phase windings that identify the vortex structures. Okay. While in the long time evolution, when where I have just a single domain, well, you see that there is no such phase. OK, <clears throat> then in order to see the interplay of the different defects during the evolution, what I do here is to measure, first of all, the number of vortices during the evolution. This is shown by the dashed lines here. And also the specially resolved magnetization, which quantifies the number of magnetic domains that I create in the system. So what we see here is that initially we have an almost exponential increase of uh, vortices. Then, through their interaction, as we said before, they annihilate and their number starts to decrease. And complementary to it, magnetic domains start to be created in the system. The magnetization increases, it oscillates, and it oscillates because we have an external harmonic trap in the system. And this external harmonic trap, after the quench of the quadratic Zeeman coefficient, leads to a background breathing motion, so con a, 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 a collective com compression and extraction of the system. Yeah? And this, is, this causes essentially the oscillatory behavior of the magnetization. If I didn't have the trap, then all these oscillations will be suppressed. And I will just have a straight line. Yeah? Okay. 
So then, in order to argue about the universality of my system, what I will do is also to track the correlation function of the longitudinal magnetization. And this is what is shown here for different evolution times. All these are experimental data here. All these circles at different evolution times that you see in the color bar. So what we see is that the correlation function decreases as a, for increasing distance. It crosses zero, and this zero is the average domain length. And if now, Rescale, if I rescale my correlation function with these individual domain sizes, what I will get is that all uh, correlation functions for different time instants will fall on top of each other, so they exhibit a self-similar behavior, and then we have a universal <coughs> behavior of the gas. The, uh, the circles here indicate the experimental data, and the solid line is our theory prediction which are in quite good agreement. Okay. Then, in order to identify the critical exponent, what I will do is also to monitor the average domain size during the evolution, which is naturally increases, as we saw also from the densities. So here, it's, uh, this plot shows during the evolution time, the average domain size. Again, the circles indicate the experimental data, and the solid line indicates our theory prediction, while the dashed one is just the fit in order to identify the critical exponent. And here, we have identified 0.6 T1, the critical exponent in the experiment, and 0.59 in the theory. This <coughs> small deviation that we see between the theory and the experimental uh, observation is attributed to the finite resolution of the magnetic domains in the experiment, which they have like two micrometers, but in the theory we have seen that there are domains even of a smaller size. And another uh, <coughs> important thing here is that the thermodynamic limit prediction is 2.3. So, both in theory and experiment, we see deviations from the thermodynamic limit. And this is now attributed to finite size effects that are introduced from our external trap. Indeed, we have <coughs> verified, first of all, that the uh, critical exponent, critical exponent uh, takes some uh, corrections from the spin healing length of the condensate. And uh, also, we have verified that if we go to the thermodynamic limit by either increasing our particle number of the order of 10 to the 8, or going to the homogeneous case, we will retrieve the thermodynamic limit prediction. Okay, and since in the easy axis phase the spin 1 gas behaves as a binary superfluid, this... Uh, <coughs> um, the universal dynamics essentially uh, <coughs> belongs to the binary universality class in this case. Yeah? Similar arguments could hold also for the isotropic quench. There we have a different phenomenology and different universality class and different topological defects, which are their spin vortices, but I will not discuss them today. Okay, and finally, what I would like also to say is that, okay, I told you that this is a universal dynamics, but this I have to prove, right? So, in order to prove that, we have also taken different initial conditions. Here I show you just three from the experiment. In order to use a different initial condition and see whether, first, the critical exponents change and whether we observe the universal dynamics. So here what you see is essentially three different initializations of the system, always being in, initially in the polar phase. But in the first experiment, we use a field gradient to uh, populate the plus minus one states. And then we quench again to the easy axis. In the second experiment, we imprint, imprint in the po uh, again in the polar phase where all atoms populate the zero state vortices in order to see whether the imprint of topological defects will change the exponent and the dynamics. And in the third one, what we do is essentially to use to be again in the polar phase, but in a different quadratic Zeeman coefficient, and then do again the quench. In all these cases, we plot, we show here the corresponding correlation function. You see the data for all these different cases, they fall on top of each other, and this has been confirmed both by theory and experiment. Okay, and we have measured the same critical exponent. Okay, with this, 
I would like to thank all of the individual collaborators that have participated in the individual works, in particular also very much the experimental group of Ye Yun Choi, Hussein from here, Panos Kivrakidis from University of Massachusetts, Kusik Mukherjee from Lund University and the other collaborators from India. So with this I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yes. So <clears throat> when you um, tune your dipoles to be attractive by rotating them over, what's, th what's the conditions for it to be quasi 2D in that case? Sorry, you mean in the, the dipolar case? Yeah, in the dipolar case. So when you're rotating them tilted to 90 degrees, uh, are the conditions quite strict to be quasi-2D now because it won't want to collapse in the vertical direction? So the trap frequencies that we have used... Sorry. So this is the trap frequencies that we have used for the quasi-2D geometry. And as I said, the um, uh, rotating, uh, the angular frequency of the rotating magnetic field, it's, it should be at least 300 times larger than the trap frequency, but much smaller than the Larmor precision frequency. This is the condition. So, so you're assuming it's in the ground state in the Z direction there? Yes. But won't when it... So in the Z direction, we didn't see too many extations during the evolution. So I'm if just wondering if, if it's become attractive in that direction, won't it want to collapse? Yeah, it becomes really highly elongated in this case. Yes. So in the anti-dipolar regime, you mean, right? Yes. So in this case, we see really a very highly elongated, I can show you the profiles afterward, uh, across the Z direction, if this is what you ask. Is this what you ask? Uh, I thought it would have gone very flat disc shaped for droplets. I guess this is correct. Yes, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my question is just is the quasi 2D approximation going to be appropriate there? Won't the system try to violate that approximation? Why should it violate the approximation? Because it's attractive in that direction. So it's going to, just like when they're tuned, in, in the normal way when you don't tune them, the mm -hmm. droplets become very filament-like, so they naturally attain a size that's not set by the confinement. Yeah, this I have to think about it. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah. But I can show you some profiles then and we can discuss, yeah, sorry. Any other question? Yes, please. Practical question yes. about the prolongation of the lifetime yeah. that you showed with the uh, K3 coefficients. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, when you did this final uh, estimate, yeah, this mm -hmm. one here, mm -hmm. yeah, you fix the epsilon. Yes, I fix the epsilon to of be in the droplet. Of course, if you fix the epsilon with tilting the angle, mm -hmm. you have to change the scattering length as well, and then the K3 is changing. Yes. So, did you assume a constant K3 here? No, no, no. The K3. Uh, scales as d to the 4. So I change essentially this, right? The dipolar length. Um, so you are in this uh, regime where uh, epsilon dd is sort of much, much larger than yes. 1, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it's 2. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in practice, I mean, if you if you can if you do this, let's say in this the parameter regime, I would say that uh, the K three is. Uh, we have done the same for close to unity for the super solid, and we observe similar things. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. For this frozen? This one. 
45, 45 here, 133. Okay. So it means that the, 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 the rotating to, frequency mm -hmm. would be like 30 kilohertz. At least 300 times larger than 45. Okay. At least. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other question? So if not, thank you again. Thank you.